Oh, me. I'm always on time. Yeah, we just had a Somebody shout out by Michael. Oh, oh this is. <laughs> You didn't know him? I had no idea who he was. Who? Kind of good thing. Oh, you're not missing anything. I just <laughs> know oh, I got out of the pictures. <laughs> I, I, I got asked if I wanted to go over to the patio. No. Like, the patio has got a hole in it. It's got a leak. It's like, why do I want to go to the patio? I said, I can send out my backyard. Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland. Oh. We're having too much fun here. <laughs> Probably too much. It's become sinful. <laughs> I'm um, Pastor Ruben. Thank you for joining us today. We stream live on Facebook Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays. Good morning, Diana. You're supposed to be here, aren't you? Uh, I think you're supposed to be here. We have an appointment. Let me see here. Yeah. Yeah, I remember now. Okay, so let me go on. <laughs> today we're going to continue on in the book of Romans. We're in chapter 2. So let's uh, pray and let's get into the Word of God. And by the way, um, for those of you that don't know this yet, but our website is now up and running again, and we're starting to maintain it and change some things. So we're making it more streamlined, more simple. There's not going to be a whole lot on there as far as like studies and resources and various things. We're going to try to unclutter it and just stick to some basics and then hopefully try to get people here. But you can donate from that uh, website and you can also go to the media button and you can actually hit the Devo 30 banner and there's all my Devos right there. So already the whole book of Luke is on there, the whole book of Acts and Romans, and then he's gonna go back and do 2018, the whole New Testament that we did from Mark all the way through Revelation. So that stuff's coming. Um, yeah, so it, it's exciting to see uh, some things going forward. So let's pray. Father, we do thank you, Lord, for uh, 2019. And, and so far, Lord, it's been a good January. Lord, you have been faithful uh, to get us through, and you are moving in the hearts of people, Lord, to get involved and, and stepping up, Lord, to help with various ministries, and, and it's exciting, Lord, to see what you're going to do, Lord, and we just pray that you continue to do so, Father. Give us grace and mercy, Lord. We don't want what we deserve, Father. We want favor. We want mercy from you, Lord God. We want you to just love all over us because that's who you are, Lord, not because of what we do or what we have achieved or accomplished, Lord, by our works, Lord, but, but Lord, just by your grace, and we receive it, Father, your blessings, Lord. And we pray, Lord, that you minister to us now as we continue on in the book of Romans. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Okay, let's turn our Bibles to Romans chapter 2. Boy, quite a few people on here this morning. So um, I want to just give a, a, a quick observation here so that we understand the context of Romans. Uh, Paul is, is uh, writing to the Roman church, which consists of Jews and Gentiles. And there's some struggles between those two um, believers. Uh, they're struggling with their works and their faith and their belief in God. And so Paul is kind of correcting them and he's leading up to chapter 3, and then chapter 5, and then chapter 6, and then chapter 10 concerning salvation. We know the Romans road. You should know the Romans road. There were all sinners and fall short of the glory of God. Yet God gave his son uh, the gift of God that if we believe in him, we not perish, we have everlasting life. And if we confess him before men, then God will confess us before the Father. So um, it's leading up to that because Paul is trying to make a point to the Jewish people that the world, that is those without Christ, chapter 1, they're condemned, they're doomed, they live without God. And so they're into all kinds of evil, sinful things. And that's expected from the world because they don't have God. They don't have morals. The morals that they do have, they're made up by them. And it doesn't really get them anywhere. So saying that now in chapter 1, now he turns to the Jews because the Jews are looking at the Gentile world and saying they're evil people. They're barbaric, the things that they do. And now Paul turns to them and he reminds them of how unfaithful they were to God according to the law. So let's go ahead and start chapter 2. Therefore, so in light of this 
this uh, sinful Gentile world, and we see how God gave them over to their own passions and so forth. And he ends in chapter 1, verse 31, where he says, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. And he's talking about those men and women who stand by and do nothing in the world. They don't vote. They don't voice their opinion. Uh, they're not trying to push the gospel in people's face. And they're not trying to change people because only God can do that. But at least they're standing up for righteousness. And that is something. And God says, when you do nothing, then you're just as bad as the evil man. And he continues with that thought. And he says, therefore... In verse 1, you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge. So again, judge, and that word uh, there may mean condemnation in the world. The world's already condemned, so we have no right to condemn uh, one another. Uh, we have a right to be fruit inspectors and judge whether someone is walking with the Lord. It's interesting, my granddaughter, my oldest granddaughter, Gabby, uh, we were talking the other day, texting back and forth, and, and she was mentioning a few things. And uh, she says, don't we have the right to, to uh, judge our brothers? Uh, doesn't the Bible say that? And I says, yeah, it does. We do have that right. Just not everybody likes it. And she goes, oh, I get that, but we have that right. And she's right. We do have the right to be fruit inspectors, but we do it lovingly and caringly. And, and she did that very well because in the very beginning of our texting, she says, I love you, Poppy, uh, you know, and I care about you and I'm concerned about you. And it was an issue that you don't need to know. Because um, <laughs> I know you're all thinking, what was it? <laughs> But she was very nice about it, and she judged, and I agreed with her. So this judgment is, is that we don't condemn the world because it's already condemned. It's already going to hell because it doesn't have Christ in their lives. So whoever you are who judge another and condemn yourselves, so in context they're sticking with what he said in verse 31, that when we just stand there and do nothing, we also condemn ourselves. And also he goes further and says, for you who judge, practice the same thing. Not only do you judge, but you practice the same thing. So if you're going to you know, confront someone about lying, you better ask yourself, do I lie? If you're going to confront someone on stealing, do you steal? If you're going to confront someone on judging, do you judge? You know, so you've got to be careful. Otherwise, you're condemning yourself also. And, and it's kind of like that attitude that the religious people had. You remember when the Pharisees would stand on the corner, Jesus said, and they'd have their robes and they'd be praying. They'd throw dust on themselves. And what would they pray? Thank you, God, that I'm not like them. That's a judgment. And then they're condemning themselves because they're saying they're better than those sinful men. Where the other guy stood on the corner and says, Lord, just be merciful to me, a sinner. Now, there's a difference there, isn't there? It's that self-righteousness that I'm not like them. At least I'm not like them. I'm not like those people. I'm not like that people. And we might even say, I'm not like the world. Or maybe I'm not like the Democrats. But aren't you? Are we? Are we just as sinful as the Democrats? We are. Our hearts are sinful and deceitful too. And so we need to understand that, um, that we need to judge ourselves also before we judge others. Yes, what they do is wrong. And evil is evil. And right is right. And we need to make that call. He goes on in verse 2, but we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. And of course, he's going back to uh, chapter 1. And do you think this old man, who you who judged those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? And that's a question mark. Say no. No, if you're judging them, you also will be judged because you're doing the same thing. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads us to repentance? So what he's saying there is, is that God hasn't judged the world yet. We'd like him to judge the world. Uh, we'd like him to judge certain people. But he's being gracious. He's being kind. And what he's telling this person that's trying to judge them, saying, Lord, why don't you just, you know, like, like James and, and John, Lord, should we cast fire down upon them? And, and Jesus is like, oh, my God, you guys. No, we need to give them mercy and grace, and hopefully they'll repent. And that's the heart that the Christian should have, even towards the world, is that we need to allow them to continue in their life, planting and watering seeds in hopes that one day they'll turn from the Lord. I was sharing with somebody uh, last night at uh, counseling uh, about a close friend of mine, his father, and how a very abusive this father was to all the children. And there was a lot of animosity and bitterness there. And probably the later part of his life, when he was retired, he came to the Lord. And his life changed. 
his life changed. He started witnessing. He started sharing the gospel. He started going street witnessing anywhere that he could. And God began to bless him because he was so faithful to share the gospel. There was a point where he couldn't see very well. He had to wear glasses and he would carry around a big Bible like this. And he got kind of tired of always carrying a big Bible. He wanted to be able to put a small Bible in his pocket and carry tracks and various things. So it was just too much. So he just prayed, Lord, could you somehow heal me so I could actually see uh, the smaller Bible lettering? And the Lord healed him. It's where he didn't even need glasses when it came to reading the Bible. So he carries this little Bible in his pocket. And I've seen it. Uh, and he can read it and see it very clearly. The challenge was, the challenge was is to forgive him because of his past, right? Especially being very abusive to, to all of his children. <clears throat> that was the challenge. And so you never know what God is going to do down the road. And so we have to be very careful uh, how we treat uh, the unbelieving world. Be loving and caring. Love your enemies, right? Love your enemies. Do good to those who persecute you, you know, and then just leave it in the Lord's hands. Don't let them affect you because we know who we are in Christ Jesus. We're his children. We're blessed. We have eternal life. Amen. This world is not our own. Yes. This is not our home. And some of us live like this is our home. And we're going to live here for a long time. You know, forget that. Our home is in heaven. And so be careful. Um, share the gospel. But don't get involved in their, in their drama. So do we despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering? Not knowing the goodness of God leads to repentance. But... In accordance with your hardness and your impotent heart, you are treasuring up for yourselves wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Now he's talking about the second coming of God, when God's wrath will come upon the whole world. So there will be a day when God will judge the world and they will stand before him and he will judge them straight to the pit of hell. His wrath will come upon him. Now he points towards the Jews here and says, who will render to each one according to his deeds? Well, it's God. He's a rewarder. So God will render everyone his, his deeds and what he does here on this earth. Eternal life to those who by patience continue to do good, good seeking for glory, honor, and immortality. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil of the Jews first and also of the Greeks, but glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good to the Jews first and also to the Greeks. You see the distinction he's making here? He's saying, look, the Jews will be judged first. Here you're judging the Gentile world. Yeah, they're evil. They're wicked. And God will reward them according to their deeds. But you're Jews God will reward you according to your deeds also. And if you do evil and wicked and practice the same things, he will judge you first. You'll be the first in line. So if, if you see this line and everyone's in line and there's any Jews in the back, God's going to say, um, excuse me, get over here. You're first to the line. That's the time you don't want to be first, right? We're always wanting to be first in the line. That'll be a time where you're trying to get back to the end of the line. No, he's going to say, excuse me, Jewish, come on over here because you're going to be judged first. And then he's going to judge the Gentiles. But then on the other hand, if you do good and you live righteously and you preach the gospel, then you'll be judged according that way. And of course, the Jews first. So there is a time when you do good that he's going to say, Jews, up front, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you rewards. Enter into the kingdom. Your mansions are here for you. Open up your vaults and I'm going to bless you beyond your imagination because they've been faithful to the Lord. Now he goes on, for there is no partiality with God. God is not prejudiced against anyone. In his eyes were all his children. For as many as have sinned without law, that is Gentiles he's talking about, because they've sinned without the law. They didn't obey the Old Testament law. They weren't under the law. And they just sinned by natural nature. Will also perish without the law. And as many have sinned by the law or in the law, will be judged by the law. Again, the separation of Jews and Gentiles. God's judgment is fair and impartial. If you're a Jew, you were to live by the law, you'll be judged according to the law. If you're a Gentile and there is no law, you'll still be judged according to the natural elements. For not the hearer of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doer of the law will be justified. So Paul is saying here is being obedient to God's word, they will be the ones that are justified. Now he's talking about he's talking about our works right here. 
and the things that we do, and not our salvation. Our salvation comes merely by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ and what he did. But our works, so Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, least, uh, it's not by our works, least we can boast. And then verse 10 says that he has prepared for us a work to do that we should walk in it. That's what he's talking about, that sanctification, the work that we're supposed to be doing for the Lord. That work he will judge if you uh, do it righteously. He goes on, for when Gentiles, that is non-Jewish people, who do not have the law, that is the Ten Commandments, by nature do the things containing, uh, containing in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves. What is he saying there? There, there is a, a natural, there is a natural sense of the law. So if you grew up non-Jewish, you're a Gentile, and you never heard the Ten Commandments, there is a natural sense of right and wrong. God has instilled that in every man. So if you go to steal, there's a conviction that's in your heart. You might not know how to define it, but when you take something that's someone else, you know that it's wrong. How do you know? Because you don't do it in front of them. You do it behind their back, and you wait till no one's looking. You know, when you do one of these things like this, you know something's wrong, and then you go and take it, right? Because that tells you you know it's wrong. But if you can go and take someone's wallet and pull money out right in front of them, then obviously you don't think it's wrong at all. You know, that person will let you know it's wrong because that's my money. So they will be judged according to the law because there's that natural sense of the law. Who shows the work of God, verse 15, of the law, written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or, ex, or else excusing them. Now the word conscience there is interesting in the Greek. The word con means with, with in the Greek. So con means with. Shence or science means knowledge. So with knowledge, that's what the word means. So the world sins with knowledge. They understand that they are sinning. And so when someone stands up there, like I saw someone posted a video, it's probably Yvonne because she's been posting a lot of videos mm -hmm. uh, about abortion. And you see this doctor who talks about this fetus as though, I mean, this man's heart is so callous, so evil. I mean, nothing. He came in and talking to the patient, you did, you did wonderful. Oh, the baby was all there, all intact. We put it all like a jigsaw puzzle, put it pieces together, its little feet, its eyes, its ears. You can see this, these pictures if you had the, the um, strength to do so, the eye and everything like that. Oh, it was all there, and you did a wonderful job. It, was, it went great. It was, it was wonderful. And I'm thinking, boy, that guy is sinning with knowledge. He knows, but he has somehow cauterized his own heart to the point where he doesn't allow it to affect him any longer. He will stand before God one day. <clears throat> it's sad. It's so sad that people can be so callous like that yes. and do such horrific things and not think that God is not going to let them get away with it. And when they stand before God, they're going to be so surprised. It's going to, they're going to be like a deer with headlights coming at them. like, And they're going to know that they deserve every, every damnation that God's going to give them. They're going to know it because they know that they sin without conscience. And it's a sad place. And the only reason that it gets me emotionally... And not that it's to condemnation, but some of the things that I do, that we do, purposely. And we're not going to get away with it. And God knows. We need to understand that truth about God. Look at what he says in 16. In the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to the gospel. God knows the secrets of men's hearts. And he will be the righteous judge. We need to leave judgment in his hands. He will do a great job at it. Let's close with um, 17 on. Indeed, you are called a Jew 
and that those were God's separated people from the Old Testament, which came from Abraham, and rest on the law, that is the Ten Commandments of God. They put their faith and trust in the law of God and make your boast in God. They boast about God. We are of our father Abraham, who believed in Jehovah God, the creator of everything. Their God was their boast. And know his will. They even know what God asked of them and what God required of them. And approve the things that are excellent, being instructed out of the law, and are confident that you yourselves are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness. So not only did they approve the law, they instructed others according to the law. They helped others to understand the law and to also live by the law that were in darkness. An instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, having the form of knowledge and truth in the law. Then he says, you, Jew, who, who understand all these things, therefore, who teach another, do you not teach yourself? Do you who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? You who say do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? Now let me get more personal here. This is why I was emotional, because we fail. Do we rob temples? The Jews robbed the temple. Malachi says you've robbed me because you did not bring your tithe into the storehouse of God. How do we rob te temples as Christians? Because we're not bringing our tithe into the place that we get ministered to. We're not giving. Across the board, um, statistics are showing that Christians aren't giving. You know how much Christians give, the average Christian? 3%. 3%. There are those who give um, 10%. Usually they are older people that are close to retirement age, older than 50 years old. They're the givers. Usually they're the people that get up early in the morning. Uh, one pastor was saying that, um, that his givers all come from the first service, early service, 7.30 in the morning. Do you know who goes to church at 7.30 in the morning? All the older people that get up early because they always get up early. Uh, and he made the mistake of closing that service because it was one of the smaller services. And he thought, to make more room uh, to to condense his time more, he thought, let's let's move them into the group. What happened was they went to another place at 7.30 in the morning, and he lost all those givers. So that tells you where our hearts are. Do we judge others, and yet we don't tithe to God? We rob God? That's what it's saying. Do you rob the temple? Do you rob the temples? Do you not give to God? You who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, as it is written. You know, the Gentile world laughs at us. I have friends on Facebook. I have uh, friends from high school that are atheists. And when you, I would laugh with them, by the way, because <laughs> I, I hear some Christians and I see some ministries and I'm just like, what are they doing? It just brings shame to the gospel message. It just puts up walls to the Gentile world. And they're asking, so why should I join that when all of that craziness is happening there? Do we bring blasphemy among the Gentiles because of us, as it is written? For circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law. But if you are a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. So he's talking to the Jews again. You're judging others, yet you say, I fulfilled the law, like I got circumcised, yet that doesn't mean anything when you're not keeping the law yourself, when you have that judgment attitude towards others. Therefore, verse 26, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? He's talking about the Jew there. Now, here's an uncircumcised Jew, and if all of a sudden he gets saved, and he's reading his Bible, and he says, wow, there's Ten Commandments. Honor God with everything. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. I need to do that. 
Honor your parents. Keep holy the Sabbath day. Love your neighbors. Don't steal. Don't lie. Don't covet your neighbor's good. Don't covet your neighbor's wife. If he keeps all that, even though he's uncircumcised, it's counted as though he's circumcised, Paul is saying here. In other words, that Gentile's better than you, Jew, who don't keep the law of God. And will not the physically uncircumcised, verse 27, if he fulfills the law, judge you who even with your written code and circumcisions are a transgressor of the law? So the Gentile who is uncircumcised, who by nature never had the law, will be judging the Jew who had the law and is not keeping that law. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is that circumcision which is outwardly in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. So what Paul is saying here is that whether you're Jew or Gentile, you should have a personal, intimate relationship with God that entails a holiness and a purity in your life and a desire to be obedient to God's word, whether Jew or Gentile. That's so hard to convey to people because how do you convey a, a love for someone? How do you show someone to fall in love? Have you ever shown anyone to fall in love? I mean, have you ever tried to put two people together and say, you two should fall in love? And they look at you like, I have no desire for that person. <laughs> you know, uh, how can I fall in love with that person? No, they don't even, they're not even my type. You know, I would never even think of it. So how do you teach that? You can't, you can't teach that, right? How do I teach someone to fall in love with God? Because there are people who have knowledge of God. Oh, they know who he is, he's in heaven. And you know what, Jesus came and he died on the cross. They know that he resurrected, he, they know all those truths. They don't have a relationship with God. They're not here for God. They're here for a lot of other reasons. I had a, years ago, there was a guy that came to our church, an excited guy, and, and he would talk about the Lord, and he would come early and, and get involved. And then one day he says, I'm here for a woman. I'm like, you came to the wrong church because <laughs> we don't have a whole lot of women here. <laughs> Most of them are married. But he's, And I told him, I says, you need to just serve God and let God bring you the right woman. And every, every week, it was almost like clockwork. I'm, I, I need to get married. I need to get married. He had this passion to get married. And then one day, he told me, I'm sorry, but I have to leave. I'm going to harvest. <laughs> it's a bigger church. So there's more opportunities there, and we haven't seen him since. So, you know, you have to ask yourself, what was his purpose for coming to church? He thought it was uh, calvarydate.com. <laughs> you know? This is where you get hooked up with somebody, and you get married, and you live happily ever after, you know? Uh, that's not what it is. Uh, if anything, Calvary is about having a personal relationship with God and wanting to hear from him. He's so not he's, not, he's not married. You know who I'm talking about? You were here when, when that was years ago. Yeah, that was years and years ago. So. See, when we come to church, um, let me explain it this way. Let me explain it this way. This is when you know that you have an intimate relationship with God. At least this is how I know, and I can only explain what I, I feel. But when I, I listen to Jesse or, or any song, any song that talks about Jesus, and you begin to sing it, and you're listening to the words, all of a sudden it just breaks you. You just start crying, you get emotional, you're like, oh God, how could you love me? Because you're connected. There's a connection there, and it's intimate, and it's, it's steadfast, and you can have that any moment because of that relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you don't have that, I encourage you, pray, seek the Lord, and ask him to give it to you, and he promises that he'll give it to you. Because his children, you're his children. If you ask for bread, he's gonna give you a serpent, you know, or a rock. You know, no, he's gonna give you the Holy Spirit so that you can have that relationship, but you must ask him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word, your precious word, Lord. May you take uh, what was yours, Father, through the Holy Spirit and just minister to those who will be listening. And I pray, Lord, that all of us that are listening here, Lord, would take the opportunity to become evangelists right now. And that we would just hit that share button and share this video on our wall and not be ashamed on what people would think, but share it there and pray that God would use it to save someone into the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name we pray.
God bless you. Have a wonderful day. If you have a prayer request, post it, and we will pray for you.